Welcome to beautiful Garland, Texas, a model American culture slum where nearly 90% of the available service area has been dedicated to the automobile. And good news, big things are coming to Garland. As in most places in Texas, the parking lots are only getting bigger and the human infrastructure is only getting uglier. We're destroying as much dry limestone prairie as possible to make way for some of the most banal human infrastructure in the world. Dry limestone prairie is a unique habitat type only found in North and Central Texas and Oklahoma, containing a specialized cast of plant species that can't be found anywhere else in the world. Dry limestone prairie is nowhere near as exciting as what's coming to Garland, though. A digital realty center that resembles a Soviet gulag and feels like one, too. As is the case with most things being built in unthinking consumer America today, the choice to clear these ecosystems to make way for some of the most soul-sucking, ugly, shitty human landscapes to be encountered in the first world will be regretted in a few decades. <laughs> Welcome to Garland! Hi, welcome to another episode of Crime Pacer Bonnie Does It. Today I'm in beautiful Garland, Texas. I'm gonna say it with a smile, all right? Looks like any typical American car slum, a go nowhere, futureless shithole. No offense to anybody who happens to live here. You can see it's just, you know, shopping centers, you drive everywhere, spend most of your life fucking stuck in a car on the freeway or in a parking lot of a store when you're not at work or at home watching Netflix trying to forget about the, the quality of life. But today we're going to go check out a prairie, well it's not a prairie anymore, it just got destroyed, but a really cool habitat, these thin soil, dry limestone prairies, uh, just north of Dallas, which is where Garland is. We're going to go check out uh, what's left of the site because it'll be gone in about a week or two, you can see they've already demolished most of it. This store behind me, I don't even know what the shit it is, it looks hideous, but it wasn't there even two or three years ago, this was all former prairie and I think this behind me is going to be a, a, a digital realty center whatever the fuck that is I don't know it sounds like something where people do some filthy shit but either way let's go check it out look at that guy that's look that's going to be a beautiful building over there holy shit masterwork of architecture a giant cement box is it a prison what is it what could it be anyway I'm here with uh, Akash Munchie and a uh, Randy Johnson to a uh, local naturalists and botanists and uh, we're gonna go check out this site they've been rescuing plants from this spot trying to you know relocate them which only works about I, I would probably say 20% of the time how have you guys had luck relocating stuff or what Joe we just put about 200 of these tap roots in at three different locations uh -huh. Uh, as far as we know, it's never been done before, so we're, we're, we are going to monitor the sites. Uh, uh, but you guys you guys were doing it in the cool season, right? I mean, or was it hot as balls out, or how long ago was it? We came and dug these the first time. It was mid-September. Oh, so it was still pretty hot. Look at this, though. Look, we're already... I mean, this is this is just pure limestone. There's not even any soil right here. So we've actually prepared a couple of Dahlia holly, some really big specimens. I mean, this maybe has a week or two left before it's completely scraped. This right here is... Dahlia holly, there's probably about 50 or 60 plants, and this segment along the roadside probably has one or two weeks left before it's entirely scraped. And we've prepared for you uh, some specimens so you can see the tap roots, and we're gonna dig a couple right now. So Joey right here, this is Dahlia holly eye. And just like you said, normally the soil level would be right here. All you would see would be the stems coming out. We know how to identify these now. We found this, so now we're mm. digging down. And, this thing has a but, but I'm saying it's just it's dormant right now to any jackass who might be like why do why do you want to save that well we, we want to save it because when it's going off it's well first off it's a rare narrow endemic right and when it's going off it's lit up it looks fucking banger what's huh? interesting is usually they push off in fall when you have cooler temperatures mm -hmm. and much more rain but since people have been just driving over this it hasn't been able to push out at the site down the road Big all the tent. dahlia holly there are actually pushing out new growth and the ones we rescued just two months ago are pushing out tremendously mm -hmm. but Jeez. this one is still alive it just hasn't pushed out yet because it's constantly getting run over by so what so you're gonna go in there with that hoary scrape this thing up maybe i mean obviously it's it's not even is it supposed to be leaves on it or what and then you scrape this up and then what transport it to a new site will you keep it in the shade or anything or what i mean how do you do plant relocation with success so, Joey, for these tap roots, this was the first time I had done this. So what we did, we just uh, packed them in sphagnum peat moss. 
which I was worried because this is alkaline soil and that's acid, so I didn't really know how they'd react. But listen, so I've had those things for mid-September. Last week we put them in the ground. They had all pushed off new foliage. One had even bloomed, put off white new roots. But they're in the, they're in the ground now. Yes, sir. Oh, they're... you guys were just packing them in moss. Yes. Yeah, now they're back into good limestone soil. Yes, sir. Different soil chemistry, of course, and they're they're doing well so right but you got to get all that root obviously right you oh, want yes, sir. no i gotta you go down a lot you don't want to break except the thinnest tiniest roots any of those big roots you gotta leave yes sir. we've been extracting these with high success and really not haven't broken a single tap root so this yeah you got you got all that yeah. you didn't you barely broke anything i mean that is like that and that's what you want i mean so you yeah. got that main all that all that juice is stored right there so you got that main storage organ pot that back up as long as you don't fracture too many roots it should be fine you know no hot sun uh, until it's growing etc but i mean this is this is of course a full sun very drought adapted species when it's going off and that's why it's got that large storage root so it has something to dive back to during uh when times get hard and times of drought so when is this flowering what time of year is this this plant flowering so usually it'll flower in the spring when we have spring rains it'll kind of go dormant in the summer and then once we have that emergence of cooler temperatures and precipitation in the fall it'll push off like a huge flush of flowers and a lot of the seed will be ready around late september early october so with the spring and fall yeah with the spring and fall oh wow no shit so it flowers twice a year just basically when when times get easy it just yeah, goes yeah. dormant for the summer a lot of the the prairie perennials especially on these very thin limestone sites will go completely dormant in the heat of the summer when there's very little precipitation and temperatures are ridiculously hot but that i mean that's what's cool about this area of texas and how how unusual it is because people hear prairie and they think i think like illinois prairie like blackland prairie this is that's not what this is this is a dry limestone prairie yeah and you get all these endemics that only grow and on the dry limestone yeah so dahlia holly is one of them so for reintroduction say we dig echinacea angustifolia from a limestone site we can very easily reintroduce that in a blackland site without any issue but for Dahlia holly, it has a very specific site preference. So when we did the reintroductions for the ones we rescued, we actually put them in another limestone barren just down the road, like half a mile at Spring Creek Preserve. And so and that's what all this stuff was. What? How long ago? When did this all get turned into this, this shit? Six or seven months ago, actually. It's that I, new. It's that new. So I had come here wanting to scout out that site because it looked promising. And when I came, I mean, it had already been completely destroyed. Uh, but luckily, I got there before they destroyed that site down the road where and most of the Dahlia Holly what is the, at. What the fuck is that? It looks like a Soviet prison. What the fuck is that thing? Even? Jesus Christ. <laughs> that's, a, that's a gulag. It's a tilt wall. A gulag of the soul. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to know how old a plant like this is, but what I started noticing is when you look around the, where the crown is, you can almost see how many times a thing has produced a stem. So look, this year obviously is coming off here. But look at this structure back up here. Uh -huh. That was probably a long time ago. But to me, that I think this plant has has been through many cycles. Right, because it's doing that every year. It puts it, out growth. The growth dies back. Root stays alive. Next season does it again. Pushes out growth. After that, the growth dies back. It just try, dies back to the root. Absolutely. And you can, if you can imagine, it probably doesn't get a lot of moisture here. No. So growth would probably be extremely slow. But what's funny is most of the remnant prairie sites are limestone barrens. That's because when they went to farm this area long ago, they couldn't farm straight into limestone. But these limestone sites are actually perfect for building huge parking lots and <laughs> huge stores and whatnot. And Texas loves building parking lots. I love the limestone more than the Blackland Prairie probably. You get, it's a, almost a transition to desert. Yeah, in a sense. And some of the species such as Vernonia lindheimeri which naturally occur further west, will actually make appearances on these limestone barrens. We'll see that today. So this is what's going to be a digital realty center. God, that just sounds terrible. It's just like digital realty. Oh, you see, it's just the limestone. It's very thin soil. So unique. All right, this is where the, the North American continent starts to transfer, transition from the more, much more mesic east to the drier west. A little bit farther than this, you start getting into limestone deserts, one of my favorite habitat types. Here we go. So everything's dormant, so it's not going to be showy, all right? Who, who knew plants go dormant in the fucking wintertime? It's mid-November, but here's a Liatris mucronata, one of the blazing stars. These things are fucking amazing when they go off. This whole spike would have just been pink flowers. Oh, wow, it's kind of bristly and scabbard. You got a big corm down there, again, adapted to these 
these thin soils, like the limestone, it's basically like limey clay right at the surface. Got Penstemon Cobea, that's another fucking banger. Uh, Amphiacris gutierrezia, Monarda, got a Monarda over there. Yucca Arkansana, of course. This little guy right here. Digital Realty, mm, Digital Realty Solutions. The fuck does that even mean? What's this, this is Penstemon Cobea? Yeah, so this is Penstemon Cobea. And what you'll notice is it's gone dormant, but now since we've gotten cooler and more wet, it started to push off and put off a basil rosette. Mm -hmm. So actually, so is this going to bloom? No, it won't bloom. But uh, it's going to put new veg out. It's just cooking up carbohydrates. It's going to store them in that root. It'll go dormant, what, in like a month or two or what? Actually, what's interesting is Penstem and Cobea will have this winter rosette until the spring when it'll push up a flowering stalk. Even though you guys get freezes here in the Dallas area. Yeah, so what'll happen during a freeze is the leaves will kind of die back a little bit. Uh -huh. uh, but as soon as conditions are fav favorable again, it'll pu push off a new rosette. And again, so it's, it's just got the solar panels out. It's cooking up energy, storing it in that root so that it can fucking go off in the spring. How big does the inflorescence get? So I've seen some, because we're on a limestone site, they're going to be more dwarf than they would right, be on normal Blackland Right, because it's drier. Right, yeah. But this grows on Blackland yeah. Prairie, too. So they get about this tall. Actually, behind you, we have a stock left over from last year. Oh, yeah. The seed's mostly gone. And who doesn't love a Penstemon? Oh, God oh, damn. Man. They're all huge genus. Tons of diversity in North America. Plantagenaceae is the family. Often bumblebee pollinated. There's a couple that are hummingbird pollinated. As you can tell they got red, you know, bright red more tube shaped flowers, but this, I mean, the whole genus Penstemon is just fucking great, man. Definitely would be great to have a native plant garden. So you guys are gonna, you guys are gonna try to save these too? I mean, are you guys trying to get everything or yeah, what? Yeah, so what we're concentrating on is Dahlia holly, of course, because it's so rare, but Penstemon and Kobe is our, is our definite second. Mm. It is so hard to grow from seed. If you keep it too wet, it'll die. If you keep it too dry, it'll also die. And it takes three to four years from seed to get a flowering plant. And we've actually dug about 50 or 60 of these, and we've had amazing success. As soon as we dug them, they started pushing off a ton of new growth. So we're actually going to introduce these in mm -hmm. a Blackland Prairie Restoration we have. This doesn't require very specific limestone preferences, so we can actually transfer this from a limestone barren into a Blackland site. One thing I've noticed is I commonly see Penstem and Cobea in these limestone barrens, but I very rarely see Penstem and Cobea in Blackland sites. But when you do find it in a Blackland site, it is amazing. I've seen some that get almost half as tall as me. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Yeah, because that Blackland soil is much more fertile and it's not as dry, yeah. yeah. But if you look at the concentration of Penstem and Cobea, it's like rosette, 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 rosette. Andy, so tell me, what are you doing? What are you getting right here? This is a, this is a buckwheat, this is Ariaga. I just want to show people uh, when I excavated around the root to show them, like normally look the plant with a top this size right here, you might think have a small root system, but look at the root on that thing. Right, right. Because again, we're at this dry site, and Ariaganum is especially a drought adapted genus. Most of the species diversity in that genus is out west where it's much drier. So it's even kind of cool to see one this far east. But yeah, look at that storage root, man. That thing is just. And look, Joey, I'm still not at the bottom of it. Right. I still hadn't got it. So oh, yeah, you got a ways to go. It's following a fissure down there, and, but you got to be careful when you extract it. It's a big brown tube. Yeah. <laughs> of course, here's here's the veg right. going off. It right. uh, looks like it's, it, look, are they done flowering? Or are they just about flowering? Either way, and then you got that involucre, which, of course, all the buckwheats have. It's a little vase that holds the many flowers, but this isn't really blooming yet. Yeah, let's check this out. I've seen this species in Oklahoma, man, and it's one of my favorite. The flowers are really large for a buckwheat. So you got that involucre, and then these are the flowers. They're not open yet, but when they do, you'll see those six petals, nine stamens, indicative of the genus Ariagonum. You got that fuzzy involucre. Look at all the pubescence on those tiny little hairs. A little palafoxy. Look at that. Asteraceae. No rays. You can really see, Palafoxy is one of those genera that really illustrates what's going on with the sunflower family. A bunch of tiny flowers, AKA florets, aggregated together, again, in an involucre, different family, but same same structure as that buckwheat I just showed you, in an aggregated together in an involucre, uh, as if to resemble one single flower. You know, you're far away from it that looks like one single flower, you get up close, you can clearly see what we're looking at right there is four flowers. Sometimes you may have more. Ooh, and it's sticky, it's very glandular. Got that 1990s High Times magazine thing going on. You got those 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 dark maroon anther tubes because the anthers in these face inward and release pollen through that style that then pushes them out, pushes the pollen out. So that's a cool little pile of foxy. You know, look at those linear leaves. Very narrow, not much surface area adaptation to a dry limestone environment. And they're covered in little glandular hairs. Smell it. I feel like I'm sniffing a, a fine wine. 
Look at it, the fucking soil. Seriously, that limestone. Oh, God, it's amazing, man. The texture, mm. the fragrance. I love that it's, you know, we're in Texas and it's not 100 fucking degrees outside, too. Best season in Texas right now. You know, for the next four months, you can actually go outside during the day. Look, Louis standing guard. You know, can't help you dig, but if you see a feral cat or a squirrel, that's that's your dog right there. This and this is Marshalia sespitosa. Yes. yes. Wow, that's okay. A, a, a sunflower that looks like an onion when it blooms. Really cool genus, Marshalia, right there. Yeah, they have loving these this dry and so and this is all Nasta commune, right? There's yeah, all that, that cyanobacteria. Is. Yeah. Turns into a green snot when it gets uh well enough. Yeah, look at all those areogonum. Yeah, they're crazy. So you guys, obviously, I can tell you, you visit this site a lot because to a lot of, I mean, to be able to know all these plants when oh. they're not in flower, when they're just coming up again. So these were all, what was this like during the summer? Just dry and brown or what? Yeah, this was pretty dry and brown. Uh, a lot of the, the rosettes weren't there, but most of the seed heads were. A lot of these actually flowered in spring and the seed heads are no longer visible. Mm. There's actually not that many fall blooming things mm. on this barren beside Liatris mucronata. Mm. And we actually have the Salvia farinaceae pushing off more blooms again so that seed will be ready in a couple weeks but but in spring this is lit up i mean oh, it's yeah just... so on the site there's about 40 million marshalia cespitosa and it's just like a sea of white and they smell so heavenly they have this like vanilla scent i think it's my favorite smelling flower so you heard a sound of that snapping but that still might make it i mean that's a lot of juice in there what i would do the best thing to do i've learned because i've dug up you know nictagenia from a site that was getting destroyed for some you know, obscene shit like a tacky cul-de-sac or a strip mall. And I, when I did put the nectagenia, I just put it in perlite, like mostly perlite with a little bit of peat in a humidity tent, like a little, you know, storage bin, you know, you get from a big box store, right. some little clear storage, because you can keep that humidity up and then give it time to, uh, you know, send out new roots, you know, exactly. but that humidity, keeping the humidity, humidity up prevents it from drying out, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, yeah, totally. That, that could be, you could, that, that's a saver. Yeah, we're going to, yeah, we're going to definitely try to get this to work absolutely digital realty digital realty rectal solutions i, ju I just had an online colonoscopy.com look at that paranichia virginica caryophyllaceae is the order paranichia is a relatively drought adapted genus not surprising of course we found one here growing on these uh, basically well i guess there's soil there's like thin limestone dust but that's it but uh, all that up, about to be destroyed. You know, anybody should come out here because if, if, if it's not saved, it's going to be gone in a couple weeks anyway. Come rescue. Come do some plants. It's, it's a, come do some plant rescue. It's a call to plant rescue. All these little guys right here, tons of cool shit. Put them in a bag, dig them up, put them in a bag. Uh, as long as it's not hot and dry, you can plant them right in the ground in your yard. I guess you could go for pots. I always feel like the ground is better, especially if you get this limestone. Or you could put them in, you know, a little, get like a clear uh, plastic storage bin. Uh, you know, with a clear top, under you can put under LEDs, get the bin that keeps the humidity up, put them in there, and like perlite, mostly perlite, a fast draining mix till they get roots in, and they'll do good. You just don't want to use too much peat or anything because a lot of this stuff will rot. Again, these are dry, adapted plants. But uh, there's Ariaganum. Look at this, it's such a fucking great plant. They do, they get a lot bigger uh, if they're not in a dry state. Ariaganum, Longifolium, etc. You got that Liatris, you got the Palafoxy, what is that, Hook Rye, all this good stuff. Parking lots coming soon. America doesn't have enough. We need more. There we go. Hymenopapis scabiosaeus. That's a weird fucking genus of asteraceae. Look at that chalky white. What's going on there? Is that hairs? Yeah, it looks like hairs, not wax. Sends up a really cool looking inflorescence. Probably got a big root down there. Come here, dig that up. Rescue all this stuff. But you got a bunch of eastern red cedar. Again, no true cedars in North America. They're just junipers or the genus, do you? Junipers virginiana. And it starts to encroach due to fire suppression because all these these thin these thin dry prairies especially were prone to burning and that of course would clear away all the duff from the uh mostly mostly the duff from the grasses here like skyzacrum scoparium a little blue stem etc but fire suppression of course allows juniper encroachment and that's another thing knocking out a lot of these grasslands my friend kyle leibarger down there in alabama native habitat projects always talking about that the importance of burning the prairie because these though this is a native tree and it's a great one especially when it takes up space along the freeway uh, you know on ramps and what the shit you just don't want it in the prairie you don't want it encroaching and smothering all these these cool plants that only grow in these dry limestone prairies it is so this is salvia farinacea that's cool to see this going off look at that that's a fucking native plant that's like that's a you'd see this in a in a you know horticultural uh store you know like a like a just a horticultural big box section you know, but it's a native. I mean, that's how there's some really rich stuff here, and this is all going to get murked. 
This is a Stillingia Texana See those dentate margins on those leaves? Three carpeled ovary. So you have the seeds right in there inside those three sections. Well, it looks like it's actually been, there's a, there's six there, but it's three large compartments, three large locules, six locules, three large, three large carpels. And uh, that's what the fruits look like right there when they split open. Those are just old, uh, old uh, pedicels of the fruits. But again, you're gonna, you're gonna have a massive fucking root down there. Massive root probably transp transplants really easily because it's got that massive root, all that energy stored up. Gonato scortum bivalve, native amaryllid. Almost looks like an onion, which is, uh, I think uh, onions are an amaryllid they see as well. Six stamens, six anthers, and of course that ovary in the center, those six white petals. I guess they're more like people. Now you got petals and sepals. There you go. Onothra macrocarpa. That's a nice one. Look at those. Look at those glaucous blue leaves. These are the fruits. Again, again. Onagraceae is the family of uh, four numbers. So you got four petals, four sepals, and uh, right there you got those four four locules to that uh, winged fruit. Obviously going for wind dispersal. It looks like. Yeah, look at that. Grindelia ciliata, kind of weedy native, but it's it's funny because these can get upwards of eight feet tall. Here it's it's flowering at like 10 inches. Oh yeah, there's that buckwheat. So you got a couple flowers up in that Ariagonum longifolium. God, what a, what a fucking great flower. Look at that thing. Ariagonum's got nine stamens, which are weird for you to cut. Nine stamens in total. And then of course, just that, uh, and then it's those six petals, that weird flower structure you got. Again, right there you got like, what is it? Four or five flowers? poking out of that involucre. So this is also going to be demolished in about two weeks. Really cool orchid. Remember the genus Spiranthes? It looks like a, it's probably Spiranthes cernua, but there's so fucking many of them. Look at that. Like a spiral staircase of little white flowers. So when this guy's pollinated by bumblebees, you can get up in there and actually check out the... Uh, oh, these aren't even open. Oh, that one's open. Yeah, they're barely, uh, barely open right now. Look at those beautiful bracts, though, subtending each flower. Asparagales is the order, of course, Orchidaceae is the family, largest family of flowering plants in the world, and probably a very rich uh, mycorrhizal connection. This is tapped into the uh, local fungal network uh, since uh, all the orchids are generally mycorrhizal. What's the leaf look like? Oh, look at that. Look at that relatively broad basal leaf down there. See that? There we go, and there's one of the worst invasives in the area, the privet. In the olive family, Oleaceae, see it's actually, it's got them them opposite leaves too, because olives and ash trees as well, family Oleaceae, are in a Lamiales, which uh, not always, but 95% of the time has opposite leaves. Everything in that order, from paintbrushes to sages to oregano to verbenas, etc. But this is a really, really bad uh, invasive plant brought in as a horticultural atrocity. You know, the big box stores brought it in. People just whimsically plant it in their yard because we're so disconnected from nature and the concept of ecosystems being a network of plants that evolved together over millions of years with their own system of checks and balances. And so we take plants from 9,000 miles away, but we don't take the, their, their checks and balances, nor should we. You know, the fungi and insects that keep them in check. We plant them in our yards. The birds eat the fruits uh, and uh just shit them out disperse the seeds and uh, now you get a new invasive that smothers local native plants everybody you just have you know you just have volunteer committees you know you get angry teens instead of going to smash mailboxes go cut down a calorie pear or a privet is it on private property is it in someone's yard nah, it doesn't matter just go ahead and do it anyway it's fun and uh, if you can bum people out with the truth in this case it's a fucking horrible invasive plant that's wrecking the local ecology go ahead and do it if you live in the area, come here. If you live in Dallas, come to this site in Garland. And, uh, you know, I put up, I didn't obscure any uh, locations on INAC. Come and you can save some plants. Look at that. This will survive. Just pulled this out. Didn't dig it or anything. This beautiful blazing star, Liatris. Imagine this whole spike filled up with, you know, hundreds of pink flowers when it's going off. And that's how it enables to survive on these dry, these dry prairie sites. Look at that, that big corm. Ooh, looks like you got some mycorrhizal activity going on there, too. Where's that insect? No, it definitely looks like it might be a, a fungus, beneficial fungus. Look at that healthy root. God damn. Get out here and rescue some of these plants. You got a week. So there's the area I got tomorrow. You just yes. dug all these with that little hoary, huh? Yes. Yeah, you're good at that. Look, you're like a surgeon, surgical precision. <laughs> all that root. What a fucking cool thing when that goes off to those ketchup and mustard dahlia flowers. And where are these going to go to? 
These are probably gonna go back to Spring Creek Forest and or Breckenridge Park in Richardson. Same exact type site. Literally as a crow flies less than a mile from here. Uh, another dry limestone prairie, yeah, yes, cool. Is absolutely. that species already there or no? Yes, sir, it's there. Yeah. There's an association we've noted too that's really interesting. Where Dahlia holly occurs, there's always Liatris glandulosa, another rare Liatris species, and Vernonia lintimeri. Yeah, we got that Stalingia. It's the Lingia Texana. Look at that massive root, that massive rhizome. I did cut the bottom, but again, it might be fine. It just it just depends how well it can take the shock of having all those roots, those roots ripped up. But again, you get that the bigger the storage root, the more energy it has to regenerate new roots. If you put it in a humidity chamber, again, one of those clear like wall, wall fart storage bins or something, keep the humidity up, LED lights, no hot sun. Uh, not too hot, it could probably come through fine. And where's that where'd that Ariagonum go? That little yeah, look at that. Look at the root on this. This again, that normally a three foot tall plant. You can see that massive thick tap root right there. This could this could be saved as well. I did I did cut that root. It goes deep, but again, it's got enough juice stored up there. As long as that that end doesn't get infected with fungi or bacteria, it could come come back fine. You might even want to remove some of those leaves, you know, because again, those those leaves have stomates in them, stomata. They're going to be transpiring moisture. You know, you want to plug up those holes in the boat. Gosh, over here, we just accidentally dug this too. This is a Liatris mucronata seedling. Look at it. It's basically got a bulb. It's, I mean, it's not. It's a corm. It's just a tuberous root. But Jesus Christ, I mean, they form that before they even, I guess you got maybe an old shoot on there. I can't tell. Yeah, maybe. But uh, either way, you got that. Uh, you, you know, these things have evolved uh, to deal with these, these harsh, dry sites, these thin limestone prairies by, you know, f evolving these these storage mechanisms. Look at that thing. This is hilarious. That's the lingy. Look at this root. I'm just digging in wet limestone mud, wet calcareous mud, remnants of an ocean a hundred million years ago. God damn. How many, how many old ammonite bodies am I like, oh see I took a chunk out of that big root. Hopefully it'll survive. Look at that. But you wouldn't think that from a foot tall plant you've got probably two feet of root in the ground. Look at that, more, more of this convergent evolution for the dry prairie, these thick roots. Over there you got Echinacea and Gustafoya. Let's see that thick taproot. See that massive bastard? Here's Calero Malvasi. Look at the, the thick root on that. Almost looking the same as that Liatris Mucronata. Look at it. Again, they just adapting to these dry sites. It's like you die back to that, that thick storage root. <laughs> There's another fucking obscenity. Look at these things. They really are going for a sci-fi dystopia look. Oh, what a shame. What a miserable place to, to live and have to work in. Anyway, look at this plant right here, Maclura palmifera. Look at that, the quote-unquote Osage orange. No relation, no direct relation to oranges, which are in the citrus family. Rutaceae, these are in the, the mulberry and fig family, Moraceae. Oh, they smell good, though. They smell really good. There's those leaves, almost kind of look like a mulberry leaf. And uh, the fruit, of course, evolved with uh, megafauna. Fruit was dispersed by giant ground sloths. Really nice native plant. I, I didn't, for some reason, I, didn't, I thought it was further east. I didn't expect to find them on these dry prairie sites, but uh, apparently they're doing well. And great, great for throwing at your friends, you know? Especially, you know, I remember childhood being beaned in the head with one, you know, almost knocked unconscious. It was fun. We had a rough childhood, you know? My friend Matt one time filled the super soaker with piss and squirted it at me. I couldn't believe he did it, but even more so, I couldn't believe he was dumb enough to then let me have the super soaker 10 minutes later as if I hadn't forgotten, so I pissed in it and then sprayed a super soaker full of piss on him. I think we were like 11 or something. Yeah, we were covered in piss and laughing our asses off at the end of the day. Absolutely fucking just obscene and gross, but you know, that's, uh, it was my childhood. See, I just sliced it open. It looks like a jackfruit, which makes sense because it's in the same family. Look at those little seeds. And it's the, the Texas ecotype of poison ivy. Toxicodendron radican, so much different from the ones you see in the Midwest clambering up trees. This is almost like a small shrub. Just tell me how you find these sites that are slated for development. I mean, I know you look at a satellite map, you could, that's how you could see where the dryland prairies are. You know, obviously you see the white uh, soils, but uh, how, do you, how do you figure out where, what's gonna be slated for development? Yeah, so there's this app called Regrid, which is great. So for each individual parcel of land, they just list the current price value, they list the landowner, what the plans are, what the zoning is, 
and everything like that. And from there, you can directly contact the landowner and they can give you a time frame on development. And, but it'll tell you if there's been an application permit put in or something? Yeah, or yeah of course. It has so many features on it. Uh -huh. It's a great app to use, especially when finding remnants like so this. So there's obviously been a big boom in development here for all this kind of tacky shit, townhouses and these, you know, futureless parking lots and data centers or whatever, huh? In, yeah. in the Dallas area or what? Yeah, it's so sad. I mean, all of these sites are currently at risk. There's very few protected remnant prairies. So most of these... I gotta find before they're destroyed or they're just gonna be gone. If, there, if there's not a strip mall on the land, uh, the land is useless. There's some milkweed seeds, still got the coma attached to them. The coma's that, that fluffy stuff. She collects some of those. Arus aromatica. So you can have your you can have your digital realty center and all that dumb shit. I mean I mock it, sure, but I understand it's not going anywhere. This is what society wants right now. Often it's the only thing that people are given. There's no other options, but uh, you know, build everything for the cars and the parking lot and the little retention pond, you know, but you don't have to take everything or you can put, you know, regulations in place that say, you know, if they if they landscape it, they got to use natives. They got to, you know, at least allow teams to come in here to, you know, rescue some of these plants, move them to a restoration site. There's options besides just, you know, getting rid of everything because you view it as disposable. That's a pretty fucking ignorant take, you know, but we're not there yet as a society. Maybe at some point we will be, we'll start understanding this stuff more and respecting it more and quit throwing uh, the baby out with the bathwater. But uh, right now, you know, we're not we're not too enlightened yet. And this car dependent shit, I rag on it all the time, but what a miserable way to spend your life. So many hours in a goddamn car. We wonder why obesity and diabetes rates are through the roof. Mix that car dependent infrastructure with all the shitty fast food. There you go. It leads to a health, you know, epidemic. But of course, there's lots of money to be made off that too, you know, especially if you run a health insurance company or a private hospital. Anyway, that's all I got. Have a great rest of your day. Go fuck yourself. Bye. This will all be gone in two weeks. What we're going to do today, I'm going to teach you how to make your own impromptu seed package just from an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Now, I'm just using junk mail, in this case, my insurance paperwork. Whatever, just some garbage. I want to collect this onothera over here so we get this seed out of a bag on me. So I'm going to take an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper nice, fold it in half. Now, this is very important. Now, I'm going to fold it in half again and make a lip, all right? And the bigger the lip, the better. So make about a, a little bit less than an inch. Fold it over like that. And I hold it vertical like this and make a little uh, a little triangle. But don't go all the way to the other end of the paper. Then make another triangle. See, that lip is really important here. You can just fold this in, all right? And because you fold it in half already, now you've got this opening. You could dump your seeds in there nice, and then you just basically take the other side, once it's all closed, once you get the seeds in there, fold it over again, make a little triangle, tuck this little piece in there. So that lip is how you tuck the uh, other piece of the triangle in there. Now you get a little seed pocket packet. Write your name of the seeds and shit on it. Throw it in your pocket, you're fine. And it's paper so it can breathe. If the seed's wet, like it is in this case, on this dry limestone prairie in Dallas, okay, it's not gonna rot. It's not a plastic bag. It can breathe through that paper once there you go.